New Testament Ethics, Jesus and the Synoptic Gospels. This lecture is part of the course on Biblical Ethics, and I am Rollin Grams. In this course, I have already suggested a method for moral inquiry that does two things. On the one hand, and look at the columns here in this chart, on the one hand, it looks at types of ethics, a character focus, a duty or action focused, or a focus in ethics that looks at consequences and outcomes. On the one hand, and then also another approach would be, and this is the rose, this refers to the rose, uh, would be to look at the level of engagement with scripture. And I have suggested uh, four levels, a specifying level, and then a more general warranting level, and then a witnessing level, which is more narrative in focus, and then a more of a worldview focus that describes God in our world. And as we apply a chart like this to a particular author or section of scripture, we can raise questions about the text, um, but not force the text into these categories. And my suggestion will be that uh, the Bible isn't one type of ethic versus another, but rather that uh, we'll find all of these different things as we look at the biblical ethics. Now, some questions and answers regarding the study of ethics of Jesus. Firstly, can we get behind the gospel writers to the actual teaching of Jesus? Is a question that scholars often wrestle with. And in this lecture, I am going to uh, assume that what we find in the synoptic gospels is consistent with the actual teaching teaching and ministry of Jesus, that there isn't this gap between what Jesus taught and what the gospel writers report. So I'm going to read against some of the more liberal scholarship on this issue of getting back to the historical Jesus behind the gospel writers. Now, that's one thing you will find in the literature as you read this, read, read uh, anything on the gospels, and that's just something to be aware of and to be aware of my take on that. There may be different emphases a gospel writer will bring out, but they're not offering a different perspective from what Jesus himself uh, proclaimed and said. Uh, the second kind of thing that you find in the literature, the scholarly literature, um, is uh, to ask the question, does Jesus reject or affirm the law for ethics? This has been a major question, especially in uh, writings on Matthew's gospel. And I am going to focus primarily on Matthew's gospel as I present the uh, rest of this lecture. Um, the earlier tendency seemed to come out of a Protestant, kind of Lutheran type of Protestantism that saw a huge disjunction between the gospel and the law. And so Jesus... Uh, was understood to have rejected the law rather than affirmed the law in his ethics. And more recently, uh, increasingly scholars are saying, no, Jesus is not rejecting the law. And yet there is a spectrum of views on that. And I will address this issue later. A third question is, what is the relationship between the kingdom of God and Jesus' ethics? Now, we've talked about this already somewhat in noting the connection between the return of Israel from exile and her sins and coming underneath the reign of God. And so you can see that uh, you can't easily and shouldn't distinguish, let's say, the theology of Jesus and his ethics because the theology is ethics. It's all about the return of a sinful people to God. And so ethics is front and center uh, in regard to the kingdom of God. 
another question that has dominated scholarship is the question around apocalypticism. Is apocalypticism essential for Jesus' teaching? Now, uh, we need to distinguish and, and explain these terms, eschatology and apocalypticism. Eschatology comes from the Greek word eschaton that simply means last thing. And so eschatology has to do with uh, teachings about the last things. It's a kind of broad term. And when it's applied to the Gospels, it doesn't mean what Jesus said about the last days, but it has to do with Jesus' teaching understood as eschatological. In other words, Jesus himself was bringing in the kingdom of God, and therefore this is eschatological teaching, even though this was 2,000 years ago. So um, eschatology has that broad meaning in the Gospels and in the New Testament. Now, apocalypticism has to do with last things, but it's slightly different. And it's different in this way. It has to do with the idea of imminence, that the end of the world is about to happen and uh, it's going to be catastrophic. And so uh, we could say a lot more about apocalypticism and eschatology, but that kind of gives us enough to go on for the purposes of this lecture. So let me illustrate this a bit further with two scholars from earlier in the 20th century. Right at the beginning of the 20th century, Albert Schweitzer argued in various writings of his that uh, Jesus has to be understood as a, an apocalyptic person. Over against liberal scholarship of the 19th century, he said Jesus was not simply a great moral teacher, but that Jesus understood himself to be bringing an end to this age and bringing in an imminent age to come, the reign of God. And he understood himself to be the Messiah who would do this. And so Albert Schweitzer said that Jesus taught an imminent eschatology and an interim ethic. Now, the interim ethic idea is um, that it's an ethic that can only be lived for a short period of time in that in-between time between the end of this age and the age to come. In other words, the high ideals of the righteousness that we read about in something like the Sermon on the Mount aren't something that people can live according to over the years, but they can do so for a short period of time. And you would do that if you expect that the end of the world is to come very, very soon. So Schweitzer said Jesus taught this imminent eschatology, this apocalyptic view, and therefore his ethics was an interim ethic in the short space before that happened. The righteous demands of Jesus' kingdom message were not for practical living over time, but are only understandable if Jesus believed that the end was imminent. Thus, severe ethics are for the interim. Sell all you have and give to the poor. Do not divorce. Turn the other cheek, and so forth. Now, over against Schweitzer, uh, a British scholar, a Cambridge scholar, C.H. Dodd, argued a different perspective, and that would be more the eschatological perspective, um, that Jesus was proclaiming an end-time judgment, that there would be no more sin and suffering. Dodd taught that Jesus um, taught that uh, he taught a realized, what he called a realized eschatology. The kingdom was here, and therefore kingdom righteousness is called for. It's not an interim ethic that you can live for a short time before the end of the world, but because the kingdom is already here, you can live according to this kingdom righteousness. So picking up on this distinction between apocalyptic and eschatology, in Jesus' teaching and ethics. I want to refer you to a scholar, David Sim, 
who argues for an apocalyptic eschatology interpretation in the Gospel of Matthew in a more recent uh, piece of work, the end of the 20th century. The argument over Matthew's theology as apocalyptic eschatology, he suggests, is not settled. And the key question, he says, is whether imminent end needs to be a part of Jesus' teaching. Now, one scholar uh, in the previous decade or so before Sim writes, H.H. Uh, Rowland argued in The Open Heaven that the idea of imminence is not uh, essential to the teaching, but David Sim thinks it is. And so I'm just presenting these different perspectives. Now, Sim is helpful in presenting uh, the idea of what apocalypticism is all about. Uh, he lists eight points. First, apocalypticism is dualistic. It speaks of an age that is present and an age to come. And it has the two cosmic opposing forces. Uh, it also speaks of a dualism in terms of uh, human dualism of those who have the spirit of truth and those who have the spirit of falsehood. So that divides humanity into two camps. Apocalypticism is also deterministic. History is divided into periods and controlled by God. God also foreordains individual destinies, but free will has not been excluded in this. A third perspective of apocalypticism uh, has to do with the eschatological or end time woes, uh, such as, and there's no consistent picture that's given by different authors, but such as the breakdown of human society, plagues, earthquakes, wars, the appearance of human prodigies or abominations. And there's a cosmic order breakdown as well, and a major final war that is imminent. A fourth characteristic of apocalypticism is the appearance of a savior figure. Following the woes, a savior appears. And again, we have no consistent view here, but uh, an example would be God himself appears or some agent of his, a Messiah or the angel Michael. Uh, a fifth characteristic of this Jewish apocalyptic writing and perspective has to do with judgment. It's often described with reference to a resurrection of the dead. People are raised from the dead in order to be judged. Judge, judgment is usually by God himself, but sometimes by the Messiah or, again, the archangel Michael or some angels or um, by the human righteous or by the Son of Man as in the parables of Enoch. And then we have uh, a sixth point, the fate of the wicked is described. And most often it's described in reference to eternal fire. The fate of demonic powers is also described. A seventh characteristic of apocalyptic writings has to do with the fate of the righteous. The pure and eternal bliss, paradise, banquet before God, the renewed cosmic order, uh, and the reestablishment of the temple um, are aspects of the description of what the righteous will experience in the age to come. And then the eighth point that Sim identifies is that there is an imminent end expectation, and that's the key point. Is imminence essential for apocalyptic uh, perspectives or not. It's presented as imminent, but is the imminence essential? Um, is it more like watching a movie and experiencing the urgency of this picture, this apocalyptic picture, but not necessarily saying this is going to happen as soon as you walk out of the theater? So the question of imminence is there. Uh, Sim says it's emphasized usually by reviewing the epics of past ages, bringing the account up to the time of writing, and then identifying the eschatological events soon to follow. Now, I would suggest that the imminent aspect is not essential, 
that the presentation includes imminence, but it's not essential. At the end of Daniel, uh, the prophecy is sealed up for a later time, for example. And when Jesus presents an apocalyptic speech on the Mount of Olives in Matthew 24, and he talks about earthquakes and wars and rumors of wars, he says, but this is only the beginning. This is he's, is not the end. And he says, people will come claiming to be Messiah, but don't be fooled by that. And there's a, a presentation of an apocalyptic perspective without the imminence. The imminence actually is not about the end, but it's about the beginning. And with C.H. Dodd somewhat, I'm not in full agreement with Dodd, but in, with C.H. Dodd somewhat, the imminence is about the fact that this has been inaugurated by Jesus. Not that the end is here, but the beginning has started. What is that beginning? It's the beginning of the reign of God. Now, over against uh, David Sim, I would suggest that Wolfgang Schrager has a better understanding of this. And in his book, The Ethics of the New Testament, uh, where he talks about the uh, ethic of Jesus, he says Jesus' ethics has an eschatological ground. He describes that in three ways. The first way is eminence. Uh, eschatological salvation has arrived with Jesus' coming. It's not about the end of the world. Rather, the realized eschatological ground for Jesus' ethics is seen in the coming of God's salvation, in the coming of God's mercy. And so uh, that correlates ethically with a call for us to be merciful as God has shown us mercy. God's mercy toward those being restored from captivity in their sins should produce in them a mercy. Secondly, presence. The eschatological coming of God has arrived. God is here. Jesus is here. Jesus' name, Emmanuel, means God with us. And Jesus being here involves uh, showing a better righteousness in obedience, in fulfilling the law in interpreting the law through the commandment of to love. And just to expand on that a bit, uh, the better righteousness in terms of obedience, an obedience to do good works, to produce fruits, and to be about God's mission. And in terms of fulfilling the law, he says, to fulfill the law is not to exhaust its requirements, but to act so as to fulfill it. That is to carry out its intent. Jesus attacks the hypocrisy and the religious show of his opposition, particularly the scribes and Pharisees. And then in interpreting the law through the commandment to love, uh, Shraga says that Jesus does not abrogate, but radicalizes the law. He doesn't do away with the law, but he radicalizes it. The real standard for correct interpretation of the law is the law of love. The law of love is the criterion by which cultic and ceremonial law are judged. Jesus twice says in Matthew's Gospel, in chapter 9, verse 13, and chapter 12, verse 7, go and learn what is written, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. And Jesus is not a new law bringer, but promulgates a new interpretation of the law. So we'll return to some of these points in different ways. But his second point, Shraga's second point, is that Jesus' teaching, his ethics, has an eschatological foundation, not only in terms of imminence, but in terms of presence. Before we move on to Shraga's third point, I want to uh, just add a note here from another New Testament scholar by the name of Richard Hayes, who has written an important work on New Testament ethics called The Moral Vision of the New Testament. And 
in this work, he has a section on the Gospel of Matthew. He too says uh, that presence is the important aspect of Jesus' ethics. And he phrases it in terms of not imminence in the sense of apocalyptic end, but in terms of presence. He says Matthew's moral argument needs to be understood in light of Matthew's narrative world. And he does have a narrative interpretation that we're also going to be looking at in this lecture uh, for Jesus' ethics. This world states that God is present because Jesus is present. And Jesus remains present after his resurrection. Remember, he says in the very last verse of Matthew, And behold, I am with you to the end of the age. So the Emmanuel who has come in chapter 1 is going to continue to be present with his disciples at the end of the gospel. And uh, Hayes says that the context and situation in which Matthew was written understands there to be a period of the church about its mission to the world. In other words, we don't have the expectation of imminent end, but rather imminent beginning to a mission uh, to the ends of the earth. Uh, Hayes also says that Matthew's ethic is more of a virtue ethic than a legal ethic focused on rigorous actions. And it highlights the virtues of mercy and forgiveness. And those uh, words, mercy and forgiveness, are related to the word love. And these words in Jesus' ethical teaching are um, virtues that relate to the narrative of the restoration of Israel from captivity. Because in bringing Israel out of captivity and her sins, God is showing them, as Isaiah 40 verse 1 says, comfort. He's showing them peace. He's showing them love, mercy, forgiveness. He's bringing them back even though they don't deserve uh, any, any, um, anything at all because of their sins. But he's bringing them back into his presence. And he's restoring them and bringing them into the kingdom of God. Well, uh, the third point that Shraga makes is that the eschatological foundation to Jesus' ethics has to do with the revelation of God's will in Jesus. Jesus' eschatology, then, is not to be identified with apocalypticism. It is not an interim ethic, as Schweitzer suggested. The dominant motive, and this is quoting from uh, him now, the dominant motive and fundamental basis of Jesus' demands is not an imminent end of the world, but God's present salvation and the revelation of his will in Jesus. And Shraga contrasts this to the Qumran community that produced the Dead Sea Scrolls. This community had an imminent eschatology, and um, Jesus' ethic does not have that sense of imminence uh, in the sense of imminent end. And also Jesus' ethic is contrary to what the Zealots taught. The zealots were those who tried to bring in God's reign through violence in the first century in their opposition to Rome. Rather, Jesus' ethic is not to be derived from an eschatological, changeless divine will. Rather, they derive from God's eschatological, saving, loving will in Jesus. One of the questions that's asked by scholars studying Jesus and the Gospels and Jesus' ethics is how can Jesus' ethics be relevant for us today? And the question arises because it's seen that Jesus makes considerable demands upon the disciples. 
Now, there are different answers to this, and I want to just look at a few of them. One of them has to do with a focus on ideals. Uh, so uh, here's uh, an example from Robert Funk on how ideals can be made relevant for ethics today. He says, have a look at Jesus' parables, and in them he suggests Jesus raises up a new world, a world in which you can imagine yourself, and then uh, that can be a challenge to your current and present existence. He says, there is no imminent eschatology or even immediacy of God or the kingdom, uh, but you can read these ideals in the parables as a way of being goaded uh, into action. Uh, you, you experience an alternative world in the parable that can <clears throat> challenge your current existence. So the parable of the Good Samaritan can challenge you on deciding that your neighbor is not just your physical neighbor, but anybody in need. Or the parable of the prodigal son can challenge you to be forgiving to a person who is really unworthy. Um, and that's the kind of way in which to read Jesus' ethics. These ideals stand there as a challenge to your daily existence. Now, H. Brown said that uh, what we have in these ideals of Jesus uh, are really the two ideals of the love of God and the love of neighbor. And he says Jesus' actual ethics is totally contextual, but by that he means that you must decide how it applies in your context. Uh, therefore, you don't have to worry about how it applied in Jesus' day in his context. This is uh, a way of saying ideals are abstracts that can be applied by us in the situation. Braun is really advocating a situation ethics, and it's hard to see Jesus as advocating anything of the sort. But this is his application of how it can be relevant for us today. Brown says that uh, really Jesus' ethic amounts to the statement, I must respond to the need of the other, whatever it is, and you'll know what to do in the situation. Situation ethics became a popular approach to ethics in the West in the late 1950s and 1960s. Joseph Fletcher wrote a work called Situation Ethics and was the primary proponent of this viewpoint, but it's a very common viewpoint in the West. The situation ethics says, we're not going to tell you specifically what to do at all, but you will know in the situation what to do, and you're to be guided by love. Do the loving thing. That's, that's how this is uh, handled in situation ethics, typical of the mid-20th century, even popular today, and uh, advocated as a way in which to read Jesus' idealistic ethics by Brown. Now, an alternative to this is to uh, still involves ignoring the content of Jesus' teaching, but the takeaway is to focus on the warnings. Actions have consequences. And this position really is the position of Amos Wilder. Uh, it's not imminence that you need to take from Jesus' ethics, but warnings of sanctions. Though imminent eschatology is present in Jesus' teaching, this provided a basis for sanctions in ethics. Ignore the imminence, focus on the urgency. Uh, so although imminence is disappointed in Jesus' actual life and ministry because the end didn't come, the notion of sanction nevertheless continues for ethics. One question that scholars asked throughout the 20th century was whether the imminent eschatology of apocalypticism could possibly be relevant for Christians after the first century, especially today, 2,000 years after Jesus. Now, Albert Schweitzer thought it could be, and Jack Sanders, toward the end of the 20th century, said no. Schweitzer is an interesting character. He wrote a book called The Quest for the Historical Jesus in which he criticized the 19th century interpreters of the life of Jesus. 
He criticized them particularly because their liberal Jesus was a Jesus who was only a moral teacher and not a would-be Messiah with an apocalyptic message about the kingdom of heaven. Schweitzer said that they were wrong because Jesus did indeed think of himself that way. However, there's a twist for Schweitzer. Schweitzer went on to say Jesus was, of course, wrong. The end of the world did not come. So by interpreting Jesus as an apocalyptic Messiah figure, he then went on to say Jesus was wrong. However, he said the urgency of an apocalyptic teacher and an apocalyptic message could still speak to us today. And how could it do so? And we actually go back to the 19th century liberal teaching after all. It can still be relevant to us today, not because of its teaching about the end of the world, but because the message creates some urgency to the ideals of liberalism. Now, liberalism was encapsulated by Adolf von Harnack right at the end of the 19th century in a little book called What is Christianity? And the answer to that for liberalism was Christianity was all about teaching about the fatherhood of God, the brotherhood of mankind, and the infinite worth of the human soul. Notice here in this teaching, we only have ideals. We don't have anything about Jesus himself, and we don't have anything about the concrete person and work of Jesus. Jesus is, for the liberal, a teacher teaching general moral truths and general theological truths. Well, if Schweitzer thought at the beginning of the 20th century that he could save something of Jesus for a church that had to refashion itself in a non-apocalyptic way, Jack Sanders, after surveying scholars since Schweitzer for uh, what they said about ethics in the New Testament, came to the conclusion, 1975, that Jesus provides no valid ethic for today. His ethics are too interwoven, Sanders said, with his imminent eschatology. The end did not come, so his ethics failed. And it, they fail for us today. All the above attempts to get around this fact then uh, fail as well. Uh, all the previous uh, attempts to do so fail. Throughout the 20th century, there was an attempt to reinterpret what the Bible says about God in terms of the human condition. And to do so, the philosophy of existentialism was used. Existentialism likes to get away from uh, anything uh, that has content to it, anything that is concrete. It doesn't want to have a concrete theology. It doesn't want to say that you need to believe that Jesus died for your sins and that he rose again on the third day. He wants to move away from that kind of specificity and wants to do so also for ethics. It, it tended toward then a situation ethic on the ethical side. You will know what you need to do in the moment. And this is another aspect of existentialism. It focused on the present in the moment. It didn't want you to live your life based on what had happened before. And it didn't want you to live your life based on what was possible in the future, but it wanted you to be active in the here and now. And in acting, you create your own being. And so uh, existentialism then applied to the Bible and applied to the New Testament and applied to Jesus, avoids content and tries to talk just about the human condition. Now, what, what that might mean, if you're going to talk about God, what that might mean is that you say, live your life as if you are living it in the presence of God. 
So there is a bit of urgency in that. There's a bit of heat turned up on the moral actor in that. But it is certainly not because of any kind of apocalyptic teaching that uh, the end of the world is about to take place. Now, Bultmann had several students, and one of them was Ernst Kesemann, another major, major German New Testament scholar in the 20th century. And Kesemann said that the material that we have about Jesus needs to be distinguished between who Jesus was in reality and what the gospel writers said about him. And he said the gospel writers certainly do present an apocalyptic Jesus, but this is actually characteristic of the first century church after Jesus. Jesus himself was not so apocalyptic. He was not a prophet coming to proclaim the end of the world. And so if we can only get back to the historical Jesus, then we can see that what he really taught was the immediacy of God, not the end of the world. Famously, Kesemann said that uh, not only did Jesus downplay apocalyptic views in his day, but that the church uh, be became the apocalyptic um, church of the first century. Uh, and so he said the apocaly that apocalyptic became the mother of all Christian theology. Another student of Rudolf Bultmann's was Gunther Bonkamp. And Bonkamp also interpreted Jesus existentially. He said that Jesus' eschatology uh, points us to the lofty ideals of Jesus. It's not a matter of living uh, with great ideals because the end of the world is coming. Forget about that. It's the ideals themselves about the seriousness of moral, the moral life. And so therefore, what we take away with an existential interpretation was a quickening of man's conscience, uh, more serious living uh, on ethical matters. He said that these ethical ideals were actually unfulfillable, but that they awaken a thirst for righteousness. And as to content, of course, again, there's a shying away from anything specific. And what we really have from Jesus is this particular ideal of love that sums up his ethic. Now, somewhat later, uh, J.M. Robinson uh, continued this focus of an existential interpretation of eschatology, and he said that what we're left with is living our lives with the reality of our own death before us. And that's what we take away from Jesus' message uh, of an eschatological urgency. Now, in this lecture, my suggestion is going to be that we will understand the specifics and the warranting level and the worldview level with a focus on the witnessing level. And that witnessing level, in particular, is the narrative of Israel's return from exile that Jesus engages and enacts in his life and ministry. So the key to understanding Jesus' ethics is to understand his role in the narrative of Israel, particularly the narrative of return from exile. And so we'll see then as we proceed that his ethic is not centered around or reduced to a principle like love or freedom, as some have attempted to do. Nor is it an ethic disconnected to theology with uh, perhaps... Uh, apocalyptic prophecy about the kingdom of God and Jesus' messianic claims as the theology that can be discarded in favor of some kernel that is ethical 
of Jesus teaching about how we should live. No, the theology is connected to what Jesus says about ethics. And that connection is going to be through the narrative. Also, uh, Jesus' ethics is not an ethic of liberal moral ideals. Uh, liberalism at the end of the 19, uh, 19th century tried to reduce Jesus and his teachings to ideals. And those ideals were these general notions of the fatherhood of God, the brotherhood of mankind, and the infinite worth of the human soul. This was encapsulated in a little book, What is Christianity? by Adolf von Harnack, right at the end of the 19th century. And the intention of this liberal move was to separate Jesus' teaching from the person of Jesus. Notice nothing about those ideals has anything to do with the significance of Jesus. And it was in order to separate Jesus' moral teaching from the specificity of Jewish law. They wanted something as general as possible. We'll also see that Jesus' ethic is not an ethic of existential truths for humankind. The philosophy of existentialism that became popular at the end of the 19th century and into the 20th century was used by certain scholars, Rudolf Bultmann in particular, to try to reinterpret the specifics of Jesus and the Gospels around existential philosophy. Like the previous comment about the husk and the kernel, the idea was that there were some existential truths about human life, about the human condition that could be found in Jesus and his teachings, but we don't have to believe specific things about the kingdom of God, Jesus' apocalyptic or eschatological proclamation of the kingdom of God, or any claims that Jesus made about his own divinity. So the existential approach is similar to the liberal idealist approach. But what we'll find is that an ethic concerned with holiness and purity of God's people is present in Jesus' teaching, not some general existential truths that can apply to all human beings. Nor is Jesus' ethic an ethic derived first from theological convictions, even though theology and ethics are important and inseparably related. The point is that, uh, and this is the next point on the slide, theology and ethics both derive from the same source. Ethics isn't derived from the theology, but the theology and ethics derive from God's narrative, the story of his revelation to presence with and salvation of Israel. So it is an ethic to be understood from the story of Jesus enacting the narratives of Israel to bring in the kingdom of God, which is a paradigm for the moral community. And from this vantage point then, uh, the vantage point of the redemption of Israel from exile in her sins, the specifying ethics of the law, the warrants of mercy, forgiveness, and love, and the worldview of God as Father redeeming his children can be understood. As we look further at this narrative of Israel's return from exile, four texts in Isaiah come into focus, and they help us to understand the relationship between Jesus' proclamation of the kingdom of God and this narrative of Israel's return from exile. Moreover, they help us to understand the connection between Jesus' proclamation of the kingdom of God, on the one hand, and what the church uh, spoke of as the gospel or good news. So, in this and the next few slides, I want to connect the narrative of Israel's return from exile, the kingdom of God, 
and the gospel. And the first text to note is from Isaiah chapter 40, which is the beginning of a whole section in Isaiah that has the return of Israel from exile in view. The section begins in Isaiah 40, verses 1 and following with these words, Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly, tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries, In the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And then skipping down to verses 9 and 10. Get you up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up, fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold, the Lord God comes with might, and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd, he will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. Now in this passage, we see a return of Israel from exile is a comforting word. Israel has been sent into exile because of her sins. To come out of exile means that her sins will have been dealt with. And in this passage, uh, the passage presents the idea that her exile has been payment enough for all her sins and her iniquity has been pardoned by God. And so the word of comfort comes and that word is later going to be called the good news or the gospel. The good news is that Israel returns from exile, but it's also that in returning from exile, they are, are told to behold their God, the God who comes with might and his arm rules for him. In other words, he is king. And so even though the word here, the word kingdom is not used here, the, uh, the notion of kingdom is present. Now, notice that verse 3 says, In the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. The passage here is talking about a return from exile that makes the way home from the far-flung regions of the world. Think uh, particularly a place like Babylon. The Israel is to return through the desert to come back to Israel from her captivity. But the sa this same passage is a passage that's used in reference to the ministry of John the Baptist, who in the wilderness prepares the way of the Lord, that is Jesus, through his baptism for the repentance, for the forgiveness of sins, a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. In other words, the return from exile is uh, related to dealing with sin and returning to God's reign. And here then we see the connection with Jesus' ethics. His proclamation of the kingdom of God or kingdom of heaven is a proclamation of a return from exile and sin and a return to live under the rule of God. This is good news. The next passage to look at comes a bit later in this section of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 52, verse 7. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. And here we have the picture of a messenger running along the hills and coming with the good news, that is the gospel, that God reigns. There's the kingdom of God language connected to gospel. And this 
two has to do with the return of Israel to Zion. Good news for Zion. A bit later in chapter 60, verses 5 and 6, we read in Isaiah, Then you shall see and be radiant. Your heart shall thrill and exult, because the abundance of the sea shall be turned to you. The wealth of the nations shall come to you. A multitude of camels shall cover you. The young camels of Midian and Ephah, all those from Sheba, shall come. They shall bring gold and frankincense and shall bring good news, the praises of the Lord. Or as the Septuagint reads, the salvation of the Lord. So God is going to bring salvation to his people. And uh, it's important to know that Isaiah 60 is talking about uh, a restoration for Israel after a previous chapter that focused on Israel's sins. Chapter 59 of Isaiah is a very uh, strong chapter about how sinful Israel is. And in verse 15, we read that God looks and sees that there's no one who can establish righteousness. And so God himself comes to establish righteousness. And he brings uh, a redeemer out of Zion to deal with the transgressions of Jacob. And that involves establishing a new covenant with the people. And so that takes us to an end, the end of chapter 59. And then we go into chapter 60, which has in view this restoration of Israel from the far-flung corners of the world. And not only that, but also the wealth of the nations coming uh, with Israel as well. And so this is the, sal the salvation has to do with the return of Israel from exile and her sins. This is the good news. The final passage in Isaiah that links the return of Israel from exile and the gospel is in Isaiah 61, verses 1 through 11. The first couple verses are verses that Jesus quotes in his very first sermon in Luke chapter 4 with respect to his own ministry. As we saw in Isaiah 40, verse 3, there is a verse that connects the ministry of John the Baptist to this restoration of Israel from captivity. And so here we see another passage from this section of Isaiah that links Jesus' ministry to the restoration of Israel from captivity. Now, there are a few other things to note from this chapter, and I want to read the whole chapter and make some further comments on it. So we begin with the first verse. Isaiah 61 1 through 11. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. Strangers shall stand and tend your flocks. Foreigners shall be your plowmen and vine dressers, but you shall be called the priests of the Lord. They shall speak of you as the ministers of our God. You shall eat the wealth of the nations, and in their glory you shall boast. Instead of your shame, there shall be a double portion. Instead of dishonor, they shall rejoice in their lot. Therefore, in their land they shall possess a double portion. They shall have everlasting joy. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrong. I will faithfully give them their recompense, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their offspring shall be known among the nations, and their descendants in the midst of the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge them, that they are an offspring of, that the Lord has blessed. 
I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. And as a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its sprouts, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to sprout up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to sprout up before all the nations. Isaiah 61 is about a great reversal that takes place as God brings his people back from captivity in their sins to dwell under his rule. And one thing to note here is that the reversal of for fortunes also involves the nations. Not only is Israel restored from captivity, but uh, that action of God is going to have an effect on the nations. They're going to acknowledge that these are God's people. And related to that, as the section ends, is the idea that God causes righteousness and praise to sprout up before all the nations. His restoration of Israel from captivity and her sins and blessing her and reversing her fortunes is going to be a way in which God uh, announces and shows forth his glory and his righteousness and his praise among the nations. And that was similar to what we saw in Isaiah 60 with how the uh, restoration from captivity, that good news, that gospel, is also going to involve uh, the, the nations and not just the return of Israel from exile. So with these four passages, then, we can connect the return of Israel from exile, the proclamation of both John the Baptist and Jesus to uh, about the kingdom of God, or kingdom of heaven, as Matthew says, and, as Paul and others will say, uh, the gospel, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, who brings this rule of God through his ministry. Just to bring some conclusion to the look at Isaiah and the relationship of kingdom of God and the good news. Firstly, what is the good news? Well, it's the coming of the kingdom of God or God's coming now. The fact that it has come now. So the reason this is good news is not that God will someday do this, but that God is now doing this. And that is what is the substance of Jesus teaching that through his life and ministry, he is establishing the reign of God. That is the good news. And, and why then is this good news to expand on that? Because Jerusalem's iniquity is pardoned, as we saw in Isaiah 40, verse 2. The exiles will be restored from captivity, as we saw in the next two verses. Um, and as a shepherd gathers his flock, God's salvation is now here. He's bringing comfort to his people. And not only that, but the glory of Yahweh will be revealed. Uh, God, furthermore, returns to Zion and now reigns. And the nations acknowledge who Yahweh is. And Israel's lot will be reversed and righteousness and praise will sprout before all the nations. And there will be peace. And so all of these things relate to the content of this good news. And we might then ask, what should people do? And the answer to that in Jesus' proclamation, uh, consistent with John the Baptist's message, is that they should repent. They should repent from sin and believe that God is doing this. And throughout the Gospels, the way in which you believe that God is doing this is to acknowledge who Jesus is, that he is the one that God has designated to bring this reign of God, this restoration of Israel from captivity and her sins. So we read the connection between gospel and kingdom right at the beginning of Jesus' ministry in Mark 1, 14 through 15. This summarizes uh, what Jesus' proclamation was. 
And we read, Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. As we move on from the gospels to read other authors of the New Testament, the language of kingdom drops off. It's not often that Paul uses the language of kingdom of God. But instead, we find the repeated uh, word gospel. Uh, and it's the gospel of Jesus Christ that is what is proclaimed by the early church. But the relationship between that proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ and Jesus' proclamation of the kingdom of God can be seen in these passages from Isaiah. And already, uh, as Mark uh, reports it, in the language used, uh, the kingdom of God and the gospel presented together in a passage like Mark 1, 14 to 15. Now, I think a much better approach to studying the ethics of the gospels will be found in Richard Hay's book, The Moral Vision of the New Testament. He accomplishes a lot more than just looking at uh, the Gospels or the Gospel of Matthew. He tries to look at the entire New Testament and he tries to lay out a methodology and gives several examples, five examples of how to use scripture for Christian ethics today in this book. So there's a lot going on in the book. And in his chapter on the Gospel of Matthew, he has several things to say about this idea of apocalyptic end time uh, teaching and the and what Jesus ethics is all about. Now, what Hayes does is something that is typical of New Testament scholarship, and he distinguishes between the historical Jesus, the initial writing about Jesus in Mark's Gospel, and then the use of Mark's Gospel by Matthew in Matthew's Gospel. And it's appropriate to ask the question whether we um, have some slight differences or some uh, continuity between the Gospels. Where is the unity and diversity between them? That is a typical biblical theological question. But it's complicated in this case by the question of whether gospel writers might be saying something different from what the historical Jesus said. And I'm going to say here that I don't think that we have a discrepancy. We might have different emphases. And so we could ask the question, well, how certain can we be that Mark and Matthew represent the historical Jesus? That's a legitimate question. Um, and it's one to, to show uh, to the best of our ability. Uh, without having Jesus before us to talk to about it, we, we can probe that question. But there is, I believe, great reliability that we can be certain of, uh, as certain as we can be of anything, um, that Matthew, Matthew and Mark and Luke represent the historical Jesus. So with that comment in the background then, um, I'll present Hayes with respect to the way he discusses things. He does draw a distinction between Matthew and Mark. He sees Mark as presenting an imminent end. Um, and he says that Matthew downplays the imminent end. Um, he says that uh, eschatological urgency in Matthew's gospel is relaxed. Now, before... I give his examples, which I think are strong examples um, to the point. I, I just want to say that one of the examples that we might add to his is a look at Mark chapter 13 and Matthew 24. A number of the examples are going to come from Matthew 24 here, but Matthew 24 parallels Mark 13. This is the apocalyptic discourse on the Mount of Olives. And uh, what we find in both Mark and Matthew is that Jesus downplays an imminent end of understanding of eschatology uh, 
and rather speaks about a time of tribulation, a time of persecution, and he also warns against misinterpreting signs, signs like wars and rumors of wars, as though they are indicating that the end is about to happen. You still find Christians today who misinterpret those things and talk about all the wars going on and, oh, the end of the world must be coming. Jesus is saying the opposite. Jesus is saying these are indications of the beginning of the end. And so I think this really captures the basic point that we can say that we find in Mark, Matthew, and in Jesus. The point being that nobody knows the hour of the end, um, save God alone, as Jesus says in Matthew 24. So the focus is on the beginning of the end. Uh, Jesus says regarding those mistaken indications of the end time, these are the beginning of birth pangs. This is, the, the end is, it's not an imminent end, it's an imminent beginning that Jesus is talking about. Now, uh, the ex other examples then would just be expanding on that point that we find in both Mark and in Matthew. And the other examples, the examples that Hayes gives, uh, number one would be, for example, Jesus says, um, we do not know when the hour is, as I just pointed out, but that's Matthew 24, 44. Uh, Matthew is aware of the passage of time between Jesus and the time of writing in Matthew 24. At the, right, right at the beginning, Jesus warns that the stones of the temple will um, be knocked over. And the disciples ask, when will these things be? And then the discourse that Jesus gives is, as I said, a discourse that says, well, it's not going to happen right now, but it's going to happen. And in fact, it did happen some 40 years after Jesus said these things in AD 70. Uh, now, um, Jesus also establishes a church. Now, the word church is only used in Matthew's gospel. It's used twice in chapters, once in chapter 16, once in chapter 18. For example, in chapter 16, verse 18, Jesus says, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now, uh, this doesn't mean then that Matthew introduces the notion of a church. Uh, if we are to interpret Jesus correctly, he is, like Mar, like uh, John the Baptist, uh, bringing the captives back from captivity. In other words, he's establishing the people of God who are regularly called in the Old Testament the Kahal Yahweh or the Ecclesia uh, to the, the, um, the word that is translated as assembly in the Old Testament for the people of Israel, the, the kahal, is translated from the Hebrew into the Greek with the word ekklesia, which means, can be translated, often is translated church. It also means assembly. And so this word church in Matthew's gospel fits rather well with the notion of Jesus establishing a people because he's calling them back from captivity. Now, if that's what Jesus is doing, then there's a lot going on there that uh, doesn't indicate the end of the world, but the reestablishment of a people for the kingdom of, of heaven. Uh, relatedly, then, the, Jesus says in Matthew 24, 14, also in Mark 13, he says, the gospel must be preached throughout the world. And this, again, indicates a t passage of time after Jesus' uh, ministry and his death and resurrection. There are also other parts of Matthew 24 and 25, this discourse, that indicate a delay of time. For example, in chapter 25, we have the parable of the ten virgins and the parable of the talents and the parable of the sheep and the goats when they are judged. The sheep and the goats are the nations. And the judgment is based on how the nations have received the little ones of God. 
which I would interpret as the um, the uh, the disciples who are bringing the ministry of the kingdom to the nations. And so uh, this passage of time does not fit well with an understanding of an apocalyptic end of the world. So if that's the case, then those scholars who uh, tried to interpret Jesus that way or had trouble with the relevance of Jesus' message because of that were, were wrong, and they were dealing with a, a made-up issue. Uh, rather, Jesus, as Shraga had said, focuses on the coming of God, the presence of God, the God who has come in Jesus to bring his salvation to his people, to restore them from the captivity they have in their sins. N.T. Wright has been a significant figure in articulating the view that we need to read the Gospels, we need to read Jesus' ministry in terms of the return of Israel from exile in a narrative way. And what Wright insists that we have to do is to discuss this with respect to history, the history of the first century, the history of the Jews, the history of the historical Jesus on the one hand, and then the theological interpretation. We could, for example, say that the significance of the return of Israel from exile is just a literary or theological narrative. But what relation does it have to the historical situation? So Wright <coughs> answers, firstly, with respect to history. He says that Israel's return from exile in the 5th century BC, 70 years after the southern kingdom went into exile in Babylon, was not complete. And when we read Ezra and Nehemiah, we see that there's some disappointment that just a remnant has returned and not a, as grand a temple has been, build, been built. And there's a, there are prayers about sinfulness that we've talked about in uh, Nehemiah 9. Uh, the situation has not been fully redeemed, as it were. And when Paul goes out on his missionary journey, we might add, he finds Jews everywhere he goes. And this is because he's running into the descendants of the exiles who never returned to Israel. So historically, he argues, Jews continue to anticipate a restoration of Israel from exile. Theologically, we've seen the prophets repeatedly speak of the return from exile. And so uh, the message of John the Baptist and Jesus is related to the message of the prophets of a return from exile. And that is a narrative message, the narrative of Israel's return. And Wright says that this has three aspects to it. So when Jesus comes proclaiming the kingdom of God, the Israelites in his audience would have expected that he would address these three things. He would address the return of Israel from exile. Secondly, the defeat of evil or dealing with sin, because that is why they went into exile. And then thirdly, the return of Yahweh to Zion involving the rebuilding of the temple. Now, what Wright says about this is that Jesus did indeed address these things, but he did so in a way that wasn't what the Jews in his audience expected. And this is where the rub comes. They don't see him as the messianic figure uh, who is doing these things because he doesn't do them in the way they think that he ought to. So we can expand on these three points from Wright. First, the return of Israel from exile. Wright says that we can equate the return from exile with the forgiveness of sins. They're related ideas. In the prophets Jeremiah and Ezekiel, and in 
what many call Deutero Isaiah, that section of Isaiah that's chapters 40 through 55, the understanding of Israel's exile was an understanding of that, she, that God was punishing her for her sins. So these two things are related. And then the other side of it is that the return from exile would mean the end of punishment for sin. And he lists many passages where we could explore that further. Yet the return from exile is still continuing, as we said, after the return um, of a few, of a remnant from exile. And Israel is still enslaved and still sinful. Seems to be the message that we get out of both Ezra 9 and Nehemiah 9. Just to quote a few verses from those larger sections. In Ezra 9, 15 to 10, 1, we read, O Lord, the God of Israel, you are just, for we are left a remnant that has escaped as it is today. Behold, we are before you in our guilt, for none can stand before you because of this. And similarly, uh, Nehemiah 9.36, Behold, we are slaves this day in the land that you gave to our fathers to enjoy its fruits and its gift, good gifts. Behold, we are slaves. Even though they have returned from exile, they are still in a slave condition. And so uh, this is what the point is that about Though, though there has been a return, it is not the fulfillment of the expectation. I would like to expand on this briefly. Um, I'm not the only one who draws parallels between the Beatitudes and Isaiah 61, but I want to have a look at that and um, compare what's going on with Jesus' ministry in his Sermon on the Mount, which is the, eth the great ethical section, and uh, what it was said about the return from exile. Because Isaiah 61 is a chapter that begins with the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. And it goes on to say to the captives. And so those captives are those who are still in exile. So this is what Isaiah 61 is about. Now, there are actually two interesting passages to look at with respect to the Beatitudes in the Sermon on the Mount. The first one is Deuteronomy 28. At the end of Deuteronomy, Israel is going through a covenant reaffirmation with God as they enter into the land of Canaan to possess it. And in Deuteronomy 28, there are blessings that are spoken for the people if they abide by the covenant. And then there are also curses that follow. And uh, the Israelites graphically stand on the two mountains, Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal, as the blessings and curses are read. And they say amen to these. Now, there is some similarity there to Jesus assembling disciples on a mount and to uh, begin by uttering blessings on the people. And in Matthew's gospel, he does not utter curses, but just blessings. In Luke, the parallel um, to this passage, the Sermon on the Plain in Luke's gospel in chapter 6, we do have blessings and curses that are stated. Then the Isaiah 61 has to do with return from exile. The Deuteronomy 28 passage has to do with coming out of Egypt, to the, the land of slavery, and entering into the land of Canaan. So those parallels suggest to me that the Sermon on the Mount is Jesus not only giving ethical teaching to his disciples, but also symbolically saying, I am reconstituting you exiles, I'm bringing you into the land again, and, and I'm going to give you the teaching of the covenant uh, that um, as, as you're established as the, the returned exiles. Now, the parallels need to be noted between Isaiah 61 and Matthew 5 on these blessings. 
And the parallels are not verbal and they aren't to be limited to Isaiah 61, but Isaiah 61 is actually the chapter that has the strongest connections to the Beatitudes. So whereas we read about the good news to the poor in Isaiah 61.1, we have the blessed are the poor in spirit in Matthew's gospel. Now the parallel in Luke to Matthew does have just blessed are the poor, um, not poor in spirit. Uh, then the next example is close to Isaiah. Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And Isaiah 61, 2 says, to comfort all who mourn. Uh, two verses later, we have, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. And something similar, not verbally, we have in Isaiah 61, 3, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. So we have the idea of righteousness there and the constituting of a people who can be characterized by righteousness in both texts. In Matthew 5, 5, we have blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And the word meek isn't found there in Isaiah, but we have, instead of your shame, there shall be a double portion. Instead of dishonor, they shall rejoice in their lot. It's the reversal of roles that you find in, uh, or the great reversal of the situation that they were in and will be in as God blesses them that we find in both texts. And in Matthew 5.10, we have, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And in Isaiah 61, 11, we have, for as the earth brings forth its sprouts, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to sprout up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to sprout up before all the nations. A further example I would like to give is a narrative reading of the Lord's Prayer. Now, this occurs in the Sermon on the Mount, and as Ulrich Lutz says in his work on Matthew, this really occurs in the middle. Uh, it's in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, and it's actually in the middle of three acts of Jewish piety that Jesus comments on. Um, he comments on uh, almsgiving, prayer, and fasting. And so prayer is the middle of that. So here we have the Lord's Prayer in this ethical Sermon on the Mount. And I would like to suggest that uh, it should be understood as really not the Lord's Prayer, but the prayer of disciples for a return from exile. We have similar prayers in Judaism, one of which is actually in a work that has to do, like Daniel, with the people while they are in exile. It's called Tobit. It's one of the books of the Apocrypha. And at the end of Tobit, there's this long prayer, which is a prayer for return from exile. And it has some similar themes and language to the Lord's Prayer. It's not the only one. Often people point to other parallels than the one I've just given. Uh, now, um, the... Prayer has two parts. Uh, prayer has to do with something regarding God and then something regarding us. And it breaks into the two halves, just like the Ten Commandments do. Something to do with God, something to do with us. And so the first petitions are, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, read that in terms of the narrative of Israel in exile, appealing to God. And you can see how the prayer comes alive. Uh, Ezekiel 36 is a chapter that addresses the return of Israel from exile and the establishing of a new covenant with the exiles. It goes on into chapter 37 to give the vision of the Valley of Dry Bones, which are the exiles that are made alive by the Spirit of God. In 
the previous chapter, in chapter 36, it specifically says that Israel did not hallow God's name. They didn't hallow God's name in two ways. One is they didn't bear the name of Yahweh as the third commandment says that they should. They are, they are uh, to carry the name of God, to represent him among the nations. And then secondly, uh, they also did not hallow God's name because they made God a laughingstock among the nations. What kind of God was he that he could not protect his own people from the forces of invaders? And so uh, the exile itself brought shame to the people, yes, but also to their God. Well, if the prayer now is to be a prayer of exiles, then the appropriate thing for them to do first and foremost is to pray that God would hallow his name. And that would involve God doing something with them, but also restoring them as his people. And then uh, they did not uh, seek God's kingdom. They did not seek his will. And so the prayer goes on to say, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now what probably really brings to light the narrative reading of the Lord's Prayer, the prayer of the disciples for a return from exile is the second half. We have the first, the petition, give us this day our daily bread. And the word daily bread in Greek, it's one word, is uh, a unique word which puzzles I interpreters. Uh, often, though, scholars do come down on the side to say that daily bread is a good translation, even though there's a bit of redundancy to say, give us this day our daily bread. But what's, what's the emphasis there on daily bread? It seems to be that... Uh, the parallel is with the Israelites leaving Egypt and traveling for 40 years in the wilderness. They leave the land where there's food and are now in the wilderness and need food. And God gives them manna, but it's not just a supply that they carry around with them. It's a daily supply that doesn't last to the next day. They only can gather enough for the day. So uh, that language seems to reflect the circumstances of Israel in the wilderness. Now, don't be confused by my mentioning the exodus from Egypt alongside of the return of exiles, because there's a parallel in the Old Testament. The return of Israel from exile is like Israel leaving Egypt. In both cases, you have Israelites outside the land and in slavery and needing God to lead them out and to the land, to the land that he had promised them. Now, the last petition also brings out the narrative of the Israel leaving Egypt. Um, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. This is exactly what happened. This is the story of Israel. They were tempted and they failed. They committed sin. They weren't delivered from evil, as it were. And so uh, when there's the parallel between Jesus' temptation and Israel's temptation in the wilderness, uh, we have... Jesus reflecting on Israel's temptation. When Jesus is tempted by Satan three times, he responds each time by quoting a passage from Deuteronomy. And the passage from De and Deuteronomy has to do with Israel um, in the wilderness. And uh, each passage that is quoted references Israel's failure, where Jesus is tempted in a similar way to Israel, Jesus succeeds by not succumbing to temptation and Israel had failed. And so now the disciples who have been constituted by the one who succeeded 
in the wilderness, not to be tempted. Now these disciples can pray, lead us not into temptation as you lead us out of um, exile in our sins and deliver us from evil. And then the, the one part of the prayer that I skipped over is in verse 12. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And this is a, um, an important part of what the exile and the return from exile was all about. If Israel was being punished for, going, for their sins by being sent into exile by God, then to come out of exile would be to be forgiven. And so this is why John the Baptist baptizes for the repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And this is why Jesus says, repent and believe the good news that the kingdom is about to come. And so the repentance um, is part of the equation and the forgiveness of God is part of the equation. Um, this is part of the, part of the narrative. So I think the Lord's Prayer illustrates um, well for us how a narrative reading is important for understanding Jesus in his ministry, but also his ethics. And uh, I'll illustrate how a misreading of Jesus' ethics can um, be helped by understanding the narrative undergirding. Because it's this very narrative undergirding of Jesus' ethics that locates where grace is the uh, in the foundation of Jesus' ethics and is not absent. So the example I have in mind of a wrong interpretation is by a German scholar named Willy Markson. And Markson uh, wrote a book called New Testament Foundations for Christian Ethics. He was actually working on it when he died, and it was completed after his death. Uh, what he argues is that, in a nutshell, Matthew is not a Christian gospel. By that, he means it doesn't proclaim the message of grace that we find in Paul, which he would say that's where we locate Christianity, and where Matthew calls for righteousness without mentioning grace, we don't have a Christian writing at all. He says, for Matthew, righteousness expresses the deeds that people must achieve on earth so that at the judgment, God can pronounce the verdict, you are accepted by me. See, this is the way in which things were understood by the Catholics that Luther wrote against, that you can, by your deeds, attain God's grace. And so he says, this is how Matthew understands ethics. He says, Matthew lacks an indicative of God's grace uh, for all of the imperatives of righteousness that are demanded. Uh, he says, Matthew has a Christology um, a teaching about Christ, but it does not help people to act, not even in itself, not even if it in itself is correct. Uh, having the right Christology about who Jesus is uh, is not connected, he says, to the ethics because we don't see how Jesus helps. Only we hear Jesus making a demand on his disciples to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. He says Christology then is just mere doctrine, what you have to believe, and um, separated from ethics. Uh, so in Matthew 5.20, he says, uh, regarding this verse, where well, in Matthew 5.20, Jesus says um, that your righteousness must exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees to enter the kingdom. And Markson says that Matthew 5.20's um, emphasis on exceeding the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees is quantitative. What Jesus is saying is you've got to do more of it. And so uh, you've got to struggle harder at your righteousness. That's his interpretation. <laughs>
I think at every turn, Marxin is wrong. Um, but uh, let's just go on a little bit more. Salvation, he says, is expected in the future. It is not already present. Through the new law, however, readers now have the opportunity to do what is necessary to achieve salvation. They do not know if their efforts so far will be sufficient to attain the goal. And some more from Marxen. He says, through the new law, readers now have the opportunity to do what is necessary to achieve salvation. He says that the parable of the wheat and the tares in Matthew 13 and the parable of the judgment of the sheep and the goats in Matthew 25 hold out the prospect of a future judgment which calls them to a greater watchfulness and thus to even greater efforts in doing the better righteousness. So it's all about works, salvation by works. It's all about deeds. It's all about effort. And there's no Jesus who helps you. There's no spirit who helps you. There's no God who helps you. Now, all of that is undone if we understand the uh, basis of Jesus uh, message, his life, his teachings, what he, what he does as uh, the basis of the return of Israel from exile, which is God's graciously bringing back a sinful people uh, and reconstituting them as his people. We've already connected the forgiveness of sins and the return from exile Let's look more at Wright's second point, though, about the defeat of evil. He says that forgiveness of sins in the Gospels equals redemption for Israel, just as we saw in the Old Testament, so now also in the New Testament. And he says, compare, for example, descriptions of John's ministry in Mark and Luke. In Mark 1.3, John is the voice crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. That's return of the exile language. In Luke 3, 3, though, John went into all the region around the Jordan proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. You see the connection between the return and the defeat of evil, defeat of sin, um, as we move from Mark to Luke. Uh, also in Luke 1, uh, 76 through 77, we have this about John. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people for the forgiveness of their sins. There we have both ideas presented, the return and the dealing with sin. Wright says it is not enough to prove that first century Jews were not in fact proto-Pelagians, who thought that they could earn the divine forgiveness. The point at issue was not that Jesus was offering forgiveness where the rabbis were offering self-help moralism. The point is that Jesus was offering the return from exile, the renewed covenant, the eschatological forgiveness of sins. In other words, the kingdom of God. And he was offering this final eschatological blessing outside the official structures to all the wrong people and on his own authority. That was his real offense. A rather important uh, passage in page 272 in Jesus and the Victory of God. And uh, furthermore, the Messiah, he says, had two tasks. One, to cleanse, restore, and rebuild the temple, because if Israel is to return from exile, they need a temple again. And then secondly, to fight and win the battle against Israel's enemies. Now, Wright says that the temple cleansing and the Lord's Supper interpret one another. What's happening is that Jesus intended his death to accomplish what the temple was supposed to do. And of course, these events in Jesus' life occur at the same time when he comes to Jerusalem. He has the Lord's Supper uh, after his cleansing of the temple. 
Jesus' actions, for example, uh, his offering forgiveness to all apart from the temple system, suggest he was involved in a self-understanding of replacing temple sacrifice. And of course, we have statements directly to that point. Um, in John's Gospel, for example, in chapter 2, verse, uh, verses 12 and following, we have Jesus uh, making the statement that uh, he basically he is the temple. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. He's not speaking about the, the temple. He's speaking about himself. Well, that's because he identifies himself with the temple. Why is that? Because he's going to do the work that the temple is supposed to do, deal with sin, but failed to do. Uh, Wright also makes a comment about the Maccabean martyrs. You can read about them in the books of Maccabees. Uh, the martyrs uh, were put to death for their being righteous Jews. And the Maccabean martyrs saw themselves as sacrifices for cleansing Israel itself of its sin. So he says there is this notion already around in Ju Judaism um, that is well known in the story of the Maccabean martyrs that the righteous can die to cleanse Israel. Uh, Wright also talks about how to interpret Isaiah 53, verse 10. Remember the suffering servant of Isaiah 53. The um, term that's used there uh, in the Septuagint is concerning sins. The, the suffering is connected to concerning sins. It's a regular phrase for a sin offering, says Wright. And likely the only meaning that would be understood in the first century to understand it as a sin offering. So the suffering servant do, isn't just someone who suffers like the righteous person often in the Psalms, but he's suffering for sin as a sin offering. Isaiah 53 verse 10 says, It was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain when you make his life an offering for sin. There's the phrase. Uh, it's one word in Hebrew, asam. Uh, it, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him, the will of the Lord shall prosper. Now, the Lord's Supper allows Jesus to offer a metaphor for his death, uh, the metaphor of the Passover, because it was a Passover meal. It was eaten at the time of Passover. It was not a meal at the time of the a Day of Atonement, which was a different day in the Jewish calendar. But it was over Passover that Jesus sep uh, celebrates the Lord's Supper and goes to his death. Passover, then, is the symbol of Israel's freedom in the past, and now it initiates a new future for Israel in Jesus' death. So we have an interesting thing here. Uh, in Hebrews, uh, Jesus' death is interpreted with respect to the Day of Atonement, which was described in Leviticus 16 as a time when the people had an offering that was given by the high priest for the sins of the people. But the Passover originally didn't have to do with sin. It had to do with leaving Egypt. And what it had to do with then was establishing a people and taking them out of captivity. Now, what happens is that in the Lord's Supper, Jesus takes that restoring the people and taking them out of captivity. He combines that with Isaiah 53, verse 10, which is the suffering servant who suffers for sins. And so you get a reconstituting of captives through dealing with sin. The Passover is connected to sin offering. Um, the Exodus is connected to the suffering servant of Isaiah 53.10 in the Lord's Supper.
So Jesus does fulfill the messianic tasks. He does uh, present himself as a temple uh, that accomplishes what the temple ought to have accomplished and didn't. His cleansing is an indictment of the temple that failed to offer the cleansing for sin. Um, and it has to do with the restoration and rebuilding of the temple of the returning exiles. And he does fight and win the battle against Israel's enemies in terms of sin. Wright goes on to say that Jesus fights Israel's battles in other ways as well. Jesus saw the battle foe as Satan, not the nations that were occupying Israel uh, in his own day, the Romans. Um, Jesus, furthermore, casts out demons and brings the kingdom, and he fought the battle in opposing those pushing forward Israelite nationalism, and he fought the battle before the high priest Caiaphas. In Luke 22, verse 53, uh, Jesus says, This is your hour, and it's the power of darkness. Uh, he also, Wright also says that Jesus fought the battle with Rome in Gethsemane when he refused to fight, but to follow the way he had already established of turning the other cheek. And he who saves, he saves his life will lose it, while he who loses his life will save it. He had already illustrated this path by going the second mile, uh, of going the second mile by himself doing so. Jesus did not respond as the Maccabean martyrs by threatening and insulting his persecutors. Rather, like the suffering servant of Isaiah 53, he remained silent or forgave them. Not much is said about a Messiah to come who would teach on love in the Jewish literature, but this was a critical theme in Jesus' teaching, says Wright. And then quoting him, Wright says, this dying at the hands of the Romans was the way of being Israel, which he had urged without much effect on his fellow countrymen. This too was the implication of his linking of his fate with that of the nation. He had announced judgment, the wrath of Rome, no less, on nation and temple for their failure to be the light of the world, to follow the way of peace. This judgment was not arbitrary. It was the necessary consequence of Israel's determination to follow the path of confrontation with Rome. But the way of the martyr was to take upon himself the suffering that hung over the nation as a whole. The way of the shepherd king was to share the suffering of the sheep. The way of the servant was to take upon himself the exile of the nation as a whole, unquote. That's from pages 607 and 608 in Jesus and the Victory of God. So this is what Jesus thought. He would bring Israel's history to its climax. Through his work, Yahweh would defeat evil, bringing the kingdom to birth and enable Israel to become after all the light after all the light of the world through his work Yahweh would reveal that he was not just a god but god god himself and that's from page 609 the third task of the messiah relates to to the return of Yahweh to Israel when Israel returns, Yahweh returns. And the return of Yahweh is presented in some of Jesus' parables. Uh, the absent master who returns to see what his servants had done with their talents or pounds that he had left with them. The uh, tenants are left in charge of the field and God then sends various people, including his son, or the parable of the wedding banquet in Luke chapter 12. These ki in these kinds of ways, Jesus is addressing the return of Yahweh to Israel. Um, also, Jesus himself represents a return of God. If he is Emmanuel, then we can expect that to be the case. And his journey to Jerusalem 
with his disciples is an example of God coming to Mount Zion. Uh, this is especially clear in Luke's Gospel where we have this long travel narrative that begins, it, possibly we could begin it in Luke chapter 9, verse 51, when Jesus sets his face resolutely to go to Jerusalem. And they eventually arrive in chapter 19. And this long journey narrative is the journey of Jesus and his disciples to Jerusalem, but it's also the coming of God. Uh, and so then also in Jesus' triumphal entry and his cleansing of the temple and his offer of himself as a sacrifice for sin and his resurrection is a return of Yahweh to Israel. Here we see the theme of kingdom as God's presence once again. Wright says that Jesus went to Jerusalem in order to embody the third and last element of the coming of the kingdom. He was not content to announce that Yahweh was returning to Zion. He intended to enact, symbolize, and personify that climactic event. The idea of God's return in the Old Testament is actually quite thoroughgoing, as this slide intends to indicate, with a number of passages from a number of authors uh, over uh, a, a good spread of time. Uh, this is the understanding that the second temple uh, would have to do with God's return to Israel, and yet we saw that that wasn't complete when Ezra builds the temple. So there's this continuing hope of Yahweh's return. Now, one of the passages that might be mentioned, a passage I like to address from time to time in other ways with Paul's writings, is Isaiah 59, because the chapter has is a, is a very graphic de depiction of Israel's sin. And um, Paul does quote from that in Romans. What we get right at the end, though, of Isaiah 59 is God's solution to the sinfulness of Israel. And so we might read verses 15 to 20 to make the point here out of these various passages that are listed here. Truth is lacking, we read, and he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. The Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no justice. He saw that there was no man, and wondered that there was no one to intercede. Then his own arm brought salvation, and his righteousness upheld him. He put on righteousness as a breastplate, and a helmet of salvation on his head, and he put on garments of vengeance for clothing, and wrapped himself in zeal as a cloak. According to their deeds, so will he repay wrath to his adversaries, repayment to his enemies, to the coastlands he will render repayment. So they shall fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun, for he will come like a rushing stream which the wind of the Lord drives. So God's coming is a picture of coming in vengeance, but now in the last verse here, and really the last two verses of the chapter, we have a positive understanding of the coming of Yahweh. And a Redeemer will come to Zion, to those in Jacob who turn from transgression, declares the Lord. So the coming of Yahweh is to establish justice, and that has to do with bringing judgment, but also redemption. Wright goes on to mentioned, and we're not going to dwell on this, that post-exilic writings continued to express a hope for Yahweh's return to Zion. And so if that is true, then in Jesus' day, there's a hope that God will return. And this is where Jesus' message speaks to a felt need of the people. At this point in our lecture, I want to return to those four levels of engaging scripture for ethics and begin with the worldview level. Uh, what Wright has shown to us is that Jesus 
transforms Israel's worldview. Now, what he says about worldview is that we can talk about worldview in terms of symbols, in terms of the answers to the basic questions people ask, in terms of the narratives that um, sustain the understanding and identity of a people, and in terms of the practices that people engage in. That, that is how Wright describes a worldview. And he says that Jesus transforms Israel's worldview, uh, firstly by uh, tr transforming Israel's symbols. Passover, for example, becomes the Lord's Supper, which is about Jesus' death. And we talked about how that interpretation um, of Jesus' death at Passover time now becomes the, the new understanding in the Lord's Supper. Uh, the Gospel of John uh, has other feast days, not just Passover, that are reinterpreted around Jesus. And we've already looked at the example of Jesus as the temple. So the symbols of Israel get reinterpreted around Jesus. Secondly, uh, the basic questions that, that Israel asks um, get answered in, in ways that transform the people's worldview. We might mention just, for example, the political and religious. Uh, politically, there's the problem of exile, there's the problem of foreign domination. In Acts chapter 1, verse 6, the disciples ask Jesus, ask the risen Jesus, are, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And so these are the basic questions that Israelites might be asking about the politics of the situation. And Jesus redirects them from that to focus on the uh, mission of the reconstituted uh, exiles, the remnant, the disciples, to, to the nations. The religious kind of questions would have to do with... Uh, all those discussions that Jesus engages with the scribes and the Pharisees about righteousness. And we saw in Matthew 5.20, Jesus says your righteousness must exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees, not meaning, as Markson understood it, by doing more deeds, but uh, really what Jesus was pointing to was the new covenant of the transformed heart that was required instead of the external righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. There was a qualitatively different kind of righteousness that was required. Uh, the narratives is what we've dwelt so much on. Jesus takes on the role of Israel in himself in this restoration from exile. Uh, he sustains the temptations in the wilderness. He passes through the waters of baptism and uh, reconstitutes uh, a people in his disciples as the remnant that have been brought out of exile. And in his life and teachings, then, he restores Israel, that is, the disciples. And finally, in terms of practices and worldview, uh, the Jewish practices of Sabbath, of piety, of sacrifice, of separation from the unclean regularly appear as conflict points with the scribes and the Pharisees. And uh, as Jesus gives a different perspective, he challenges the worldview of those scribes and Pharisees and offers a different perspective. So Jesus' narrative ethic plays out um, at the worldview level, but we can also see how it does at the specifying and the warranting level as well. At the specifying level, of course, we have the whole discussion about Jesus and the law. The ongoing validity of the law is something that uh, has been much in debate. And my argument is with Roger Morlan in his book, Matthew and Paul, A Comparison of Ethical Perspectives. Uh, Morlan argues that both see a continuity of the early church and of Jesus with the law of the Old Testament. 
Morlong says that Matthew 5, 17 through 19 suggests that the entire law remains valid and demands strict obedience. The passage reads this way, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does, does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So Morlong says that uh, the passage is a great example of how there is continuing validity to the law. In uh, Matthew 5:18c, Jesus says, "Until everything comes to pass." And that's not a reference to Jesus' life and work on, or, or to the early church, as if, okay, now we can move beyond the law, but rather 5:18a, until heaven and earth pass away." Um, clarifies that the law is eternally valid, or more likely that the law is valid until the end of this age and the age and the beginning of the age to come, the eschaton. As we look at Jesus' various conflicts with scribes and Pharisees, we see that he continues to uphold the law. The issue is how to interpret the law. There's the conflict over the Sabbath, or ritual cleanness, or the tradition, or divorce and remarriage, or the greatest commandment. Nowhere does Jesus say, well, that was the law, but we're moving beyond the law now. The issue is interpretation. Now, there's an interesting point that might be noted uh, about Matthew and Mark on the issue of ritual cleanness. In Mark's gospel, when Jesus says, look, what makes you unclean is what comes out of the heart, uh, out of the heart um, and through the mouth, um, rather than what goes into the mouth, Mark, Mark adds the parenthetical comment, therefore Jesus was making all food clean. And Matthew just omits that. Matthew's copying Mark's gospel, but he omits that, which indicates that Matthew is intentionally trying to de-emphasize uh, uh, any kind of discrepancy between the law and Jesus. And then when we come to Matthew 23, where Jesus um, calls the scribes and Pharisees hypocrites and brings judgment down upon them, he is, um, what he's doing there is he's calling them into question because they are hypocrites, not because they're following the law. Uh, he's, he's saying you are straining at a gnat and swallowing a camel by focusing on tithing spices as opposed to um, living and abiding by the weightier commandments of the law. And with re divorce and remarriage, yes, there is a tension between allowing a divorce on the part of Moses and Jesus saying, don't divorce and remarry in Matthew 19. But what Jesus is doing is he's interpreting the law in light of the intention of God in creation. It's an interpretation issue. And with the greatest commandment in Matthew 22, Jesus is not saying, instead of the laws of Moses, just live by love of God and love of neighbor. What he actually says is, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets, so they continue to be valid. So the issue is, how do you rightly interpret the law? Jesus' opposition to the Pharisees is not their legalism, 
but their lawlessness, as I've also put into a blog post of mine that's at the bottom of this slide, uh, his kingdom ethic is an ethic of the heart. And in that way, he's fulfilling what we find in Deuteronomy and in Jeremiah, uh, an ethic of the heart. This is, uh, this is new covenant righteousness, um, as we find in Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel. They're not guilty of moral antinomianism, that is, uh, of not following the law, but of externalism. And that externalism can be, uh, there, it can be described in these different ways. One is just hypocrisy. You're kind of putting on a show. Hypocrite means an actor in Greek. And uh, so there's the problem of lip service with hearts far from God or putting on a show of piety in various passages in Matthew. Another way of understanding this externalism of the scribes and the Pharisees is their failure to keep the law. They actually don't keep all the law. They break the commandment or the word of God for the sake of their tradition, we read in Matthew 15. And Jesus indicts them for being blind guides. It's not that the law is the problem, it's the guides are the problem. They teach as doctrines the commandments of men, their own teaching rather than the teaching of the law. And fourthly, they major, major in the minors and minor in the majors. They apply the law without love, mercy, or forgiveness. And so in these ways, Jesus opposes the Pharisees and the scribes without opposing the law. So this takes us back to the antitheses of Matthew 5, 20 to 48. In what ways must the disciples uh, exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees? Does it have to do with quantity, more rules and regulations, like Markson said, or quality, loving uh, uh, application of the law? Or thirdly, and this would be my suggestion, something that kind of combines those two ideas but is, is different, and that is uh, moving from an external following of the law to an internal righteousness. Instead of understanding law as the letter, it's now the transformed heart that God always intended for his people to have from the time that the law was given to Moses uh, to now the new covenant righteousness, which is an internal righteousness of the heart that Jesus is teaching. So in the antitheses, it's not just murder that's wrong, but it's anger. You see the move to the heart. It's not just adultery, it's lust or divorce and remarriage that causes adultery. It's not just lying by oaths, but it's simple truth-telling that kingdom righteousness requires. It's not just getting back justice, but giving more justice. It's not just finding out how you can restrict love to a certain degree, but it's even going to the extent of loving enemies. There's an interesting interpretation of these antitheses and of the whole Sermon on the Mount that we find in a book by Glenn Stassen and David Gushy called Kingdom Ethics, Following Jesus in Contemporary Context. And I find it uh, helpful, uh, although I don't think it's the whole picture. Now, what we get here in this table is the suggestion that Stassen made in, in this book and also in an important article that he published on this. What he suggests is what's going on here is a noting of what the traditional righteousness is and then an identification of how we get ourselves into a vicious circle that we are stuck in, like stuck in a rut, and uh, then 
a suggestion of a transforming initiative that might be taken to get us out of that vicious cycle. So an example might be the traditional righteousness says, you shall not kill. And then the problem is that we get angry and we say things like, you fool, to someone. So the transforming initiative, Jesus suggests, is go and be reconciled. Now where I think this is helpful is I think it's showing that Jesus' ethics is not an ethic of ideals. And it's not an ethic that simply cannot be performed, but it's actually a very practical ethic. And we do get an expectation that, yes, indeed, this is how you are now to live, because you are my disciples. Uh, Stassen uh, used to make the comment that uh, many evangelicals try to find ways around the Sermon on the Mount to say, you know what, it's, it's, it's just too difficult to follow. And, and also non-evangelicals, many people are engaged in the act of trying to say, look, this doesn't really apply to us. It, it's perhaps a future ethic or it's an ideal ethic that we strive for or, or some other interpretation. In fact, there are many, many interpretations. But what Stassen says and following a more Anabaptist approach to the use of the Sermon on the Mount as an important part of that church tradition, he says, no, this, this is really quite practical. So I think this is helpful, but I also think that we need to say that what's going on here in these antitheses is Jesus calling his disciples to a heart ethic of the new covenant. It's more than just transforming initiatives that we can take. Um, it, yes, it is practical, but it's practical because it involves a changed heart, that the new covenant act of God, the merciful God, bringing his people out of exile, will perform in us. So we can be called to a higher righteousness um, for that very reason. And then the warranting level of ethics. So we've talked about the specifying level, and we've talked about the worldview level, and we've actually talked a lot about the uh, the the level that third level that is more of a narrative approach uh, to ethics, which is what I call the witnessing level. But now, finally, the warranting level, uh, where we find principles, or we find values, or we find virtues mentioned. Yes, that's also what we find in Jesus' ethics, but it's related to the narrative. Uh, mercy and forgiveness and love are warrants based on God's gracious act of salvation in Jesus Christ for a people that are dwelling in exile because of their sins. And love does sum up the law, but it does not replace the law, as we've already said. That Matthew 22, 36 through 40 passage does allow us to say that here we have a warrant for action, love, but it is not a replacement of the concrete ethics of what is said in the law and the prophets. So we have a kind of triangle here where we, we might say love is at the top, but it, it, it's at the top of something. And it's at the top of under, giving us an understanding of the Ten Commandments, which are not just Ten Commandments, but they're, they're commandments under which we can put all the commandments of the Law and the Prophets. Um, and this continues to be uh, relevant for the disciples and relevant for the Church. This is probably a good time to ask the question then, what did not carry over from the law to the church? And I would suggest a few th points here. The problem with the law was not its rules, regulations, commandments, etc. It was not the spe specifying ethics of Scripture. These continue to be useful in the church to define the boundaries of righteousness. The problem was, firstly, that the people were sinful, not that they were legalists, despite the law, 
and secondly, that the law was powerless to make them righteous. And another point, the law's penalties. The church was a voluntary society, not a state. The penalties of the Old Testament needed then to be reinterpreted. And we have an example of that in 1 Corinthians 5, where ostracism from the church replaces the death penalty to separate a person from the people in uh, the Old Testament on the issue of a man sleeping with his father's wife. That's recorded in Leviticus 18. So there's a, there's a change of the penalty because the church as the people of God is not the same as Israel, the state, in the Old Testament. Uh, with respect to the laws of sacrifice, Jesus replaced the temple. Uh, with respect to the national identity laws, separating Jews from Gentiles who had now been united in Christ, we see some change. The food laws, the feast days, the circumcision, the ethnic separation of uh, eating or marrying did not carry over. Now, they were optional. Jews could continue to follow food laws. But um, we get the vision that Peter has in the book of Acts of the sheet full of unclean food and him being commanded to take and eat as a way of understanding that God is now including the Gentiles in his salvation. So what did carry over were laws of holiness and purity for both Jews and the aliens that dwelt in their midst, um, a phrase that we find in the Holiness Code. Now we have the Jews and the Gentiles in view in the church and that affects those national identity laws. And then finally, the laws accommodating sinful existence, like divorce and remarriage from Deuteronomy 24, um, are not what God intended in creation and do not fit the redeemed kingdom of God community. And so they have to be reinterpreted.